right now we have Ruth to come sing. Their chains were fastened tight There in the jail that night Still Paul and Silas would not be dismayed They said it's time to lift our voice Sing praises to the Lord Let's prove that we will trust Him Come what may God wants to hear you sing When the waves are crashing around you When the fiery darts surround you When despair is all you see God wants to hear your voice When the wisest man has spoken And said your circumstance is as hopeless as can be that's when God wants to hear you sing. He loves to hear our praise on our cheerful days when the happy times outweigh the bad by far but when suffering comes along and we still sing him songs that is when we bless the father's heart god wants to hear you sing when the waves are crashing around you when the fiery darts surround you, when despair is all you see, God wants to hear your voice. When the wisest man has spoken and said your circumstance is as hopeless as can be, that's when God wants to hear you see. God wants to hear you sing When the waves are crashing around you When the fiery darts surround you When despair is all you see God wants to hear your voice When the wisest man has spoken And said your circumstance is as hopeless as can be that's when God wants to hear you sing. God wants to hear you sing. God wants to hear you sing. Amen. Thank you very much, Ruth. Second Samuel, chapter 15. Spurgeon, who in the mid part of the 1800s, if you get too many points, you kind of say he was turning back to the Puritans of a couple hundred years before. What I've got tonight is kind of a study several points that we can hit quickly and move on, but it's kind of a study. Let's read 
2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 13. 2 Samuel 15, verse 13. And there came a messenger to David, saying, The hearts of the men of Israel are after Absalom. Father, we ask you to bless as we look to your precious word. God, speak to our hearts, we pray. God, thank you for the precious word, and I have preserved it for us. Now, just bless as we study it tonight. We pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that song that uh, Mrs. Lang just sang had to do with tough times a little bit and how we act in them. And this morning we talked about discouragement and self-pity. And now we're going to see a time when David and others are entering into a bit of a challenge themselves. King David, the man who the Bible refers to as the man that was raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, the sweet psalmist of Israel, the man after God's own heart, had his own chances to be down. We're about to read a time in his life that was definitely one of them. I'm going to go back to verse 10 of what we just read, 2 Samuel 15, 10. But Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then you shall say, Absalom reigneth in Hebron. And with Absalom went 200 men out of Jerusalem that were called, and they went in their simplicity, and they knew not anything. And Absalom sent for Ahithophel, excuse me, Ahithophel, the Gilonite, David's counselor. Now, this is David's counselor, Ahithophel. He sends for him. From his city, even from Gilo, while he offered sacrifices, and the conspiracy was strong, for the people increased continually with Absalom, and there came a messenger to David, saying, The hearts of the men of Israel are after Absalom. Now, we probably remember how Absalom got together and people uh, were waiting to see the king and maybe backed up a little bit. And he'd come along and say, Boy, uh, he, what's your cause? And he'd talk to them and they'd explain their situation. And he'd say, Boy, you got a good cause there, but it's too bad that nobody is deputed to take care of this matter. You know? Kind of the way we criticize Obama sometimes, President Obama, for those up there in TV land that might be tuning into our website. But, you know, kind of the way we criticize, and he's over there, and he's criticizing. He said, too bad there isn't a guy, you know, that can handle your problem. You know, the king hasn't taken care of that very well. And the Bible says that he stole the hearts of the men of Israel. And it worked. You know, a little behind-the-scenes complaining, a little undermining of authority, and it worked. And the minute I hear a preacher start talking about undermining of authority and all of that and griping, usually it's a message about their own authority and how people are, you know, questioning some of their decisions. You know, like they decide to uh, build a new building that they're going to two years later leave town after they led the church into three, four, five million dollars of debt. You know, that kind of thing. But usually that's what's going on when you get led into this. You say, oh, well, I know where the preacher's going now. Well, that's not where I'm going. Talking about David. So David's leaving town, and it's called the city of David, Jerusalem is, and he's leaving. Because of rebellion, he's being driven out, and his own son is leading the rebellion. So I don't know how you feel about life, but uh, King David, you know, the, the man that we call the God, a uh, man after God's own heart, the Bible calls him that, the sweet psalmist of Israel, that's the Bible says that, uh, the anointed one of God and of Jacob. You know, that guy, the great king of Israel, is being driven out of town because the people don't want him anymore, and its own son is the one doing the driving, Absalom. It's not a very good day, amen? People don't like him anymore. It happens. People were ready to stone David at one time. They were ready to stone Moses. It happens. How's David going to react? How's he going to, quote, unquote, handle this situation? How's God going to react? What's God going to do? 
Uh, when in the song, uh, God shook the uh, jail, opened the doors of the prison, released their shackles, and allowed them to lead the Philippian jailer to Christ. How's God going to react? What's he going to do? And I think the answer is somewhat obvious. Does how David react reacts going to determine how God reacts? You know, we get into that sovereignty of God and the free will of man again. I think I told you that uh, we are reading uh, one of Peter Ruckman's books, and he was getting up for his doctorate, I guess, and they were giving him uh, his inquisition or questioning, and they said, uh, are you an Arminianist, uh, Arminian, or Calvinist? Now, Arminian is your free will, that's your Methodist and your Nazarenes, and the Calvinist, pretty much a Baptist, although we're not five-pointers usually, we're not hyper-Calvinist and all of that. But, you know, they asked him that question, and nobody's ever been able to really answer that question. And he said this. He said, I'm an Arminianist until I get to the cross. And once I got to the cross, I was a Calvinist, because at that point, I was predestinated to be saved. We can't figure this all out. And, you know, we say, look, man, uh, well, hey, if God wants me to win souls, He'll, he'll put me out there to win them. God wants to win souls, he'll win them. Look, God uses human instrumentality. God wants me to get saved, he'll pick me up out of the pew and bring me down to the altar. No, he won't. No, he won't. And Dr. Smith was mentioning this morning in Sunday school and talking about Jesus knocking on that door. And he talked about in the old days there was no door, uh, doorknob on it. And then later there was a doorknob. And I started thinking, hmm. In the old days, they were free will, free will Baptists, because the handle was on the inside and they had to open it. Then later they put the handle on the outside, and, and, uh, now God is the sovereignty of God, because He's got to open it. Well listen, <laughs> it's both, amen? God's not gonna force Himself on us. God offers Himself to us, and then we make the decision to receive Him. And every man, woman, boy, and girl, over the age of accountability, has that opportunity and could. You're here tonight because you decided to come. Amen? Now, I understand the Bible says it's of him both to will and to do of his good pleasure. But man, you know, we're taught the theologically, we are volitional creatures. We have a will. And we exercise that will. Amen? We exercise it. We decide to read our Bible. How many people have to push themselves occasionally to read their Bible? How many people say, hey, wait a minute, I'm going to pray? Right? We make decisions to do those things. So at any rate, how David reacts, I believe, has an, has an influence on how God reacts. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. How we react, or how we act, determines how God reacts. Well, we confess, he forgives. Amen? If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So you're doing something, and when you do something, God reacts to it. You put your trust in Christ, he saves you. You don't confess him, you don't get saved. Amen? You die and go to hell. So, let's keep this in balance, amen? Let's keep our wagon in the middle of the road. Let's understand that God's in charge, but we have decisions to make, and those decisions make a big difference. And you're going to see some right here. I want you to see some of the people and events that help define the overall event that we're talking about. Kind of the little pieces in the puzzle. We've probably all done a little jigsaw puzzle. I don't want one with a thousand pieces, do you? Give me one that the eight-year-olds do so I can throw it right together. But we see those little pieces come together, and man, the big picture finally comes into view. They say the whole in mathematics, the whole is equal to the sum of its parts. And uh, Aristotle said, or it's attributed to him at least, in certain respects, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Must have been talking about the San Antonio Spurs. But anyway, the, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So, there are some little things here that leads to the big things with, that lead to the big things with God. And I would like to, you know, take a look at them this evening. 
And I want you to watch how the story unfolds by character, by event, and by spiritual truth. Now, as I uh, mentioned, I got at least eight points. I'm going to be quick. First, you know the story. Say, so what is the story? David's getting driven out of town by Absalom, his son. Okay? First thing I want to mention is recognition, if you will. Second Samuel chapter 15, verse 19. Second Samuel chapter 15, verse 19. Then said the king to Idai the Gittite, Wherefore goest thou also with us? Return to thy place and abide with the king, for thou art a stranger and also an exile. Now, this is a guy that kind of appears. We don't know what happened, but he came from, uh, you know, outlying areas. And he came in there and decided that he was going to stick with, with David, even though he hadn't been around David for long. And David said, look, you're just a stranger here. Why don't you just go back? You don't need to come running out with me. He said, return to thy place and abide with the king, for thou art a stranger and also an exile. Whereas thou camest but yesterday, should I this day make thee go up and down with us, seeing I go whither I may? Return thou and take back thy brethren. Mercy and truth be with thee. And Idai answered the king and said, as the Lord liveth, and as my lord the king liveth, surely in what place my lord the king shall be, whether in death or life, even there shall also, even there also will thy servant be. Now, I called it recognition. I could have called it a lot of things. Could have called it spiritual vision. But it reminds me of Ruth, whether thou goest, I'll go, and treat me not to leave thee, said to Naomi. Uh, Laban and Jacob, Jacob was over there, and Jacob was going to turn off and uh, take off, and Laban, Laban said to him, look, I've learned by experience that God's blessed me for you. Now, Lot should have learned that, shouldn't he? Lot took off from Abraham, and things didn't go very well. He ended up in Sodom and Gomorrah, you might remember. And that's not the only trouble he got into, but it was pretty big. His wife got turned into a pillar of salt. He ran into moral difficulty with... Uh, with a couple of his daughters and others were burned up in the, in the, uh, the atomic explosion there, the nuclear reaction. So I'm looking at this first thing, say, look, here's a guy, he knew that there was a place to be. And he wanted to be around the guy that was God's man. And he wasn't going anywhere else. Call it spiritual vision if you want to. Call it whatever. I called it recognition. Can we recognize the place of God's blessing? People will get adrift. They're who knows where. They're down to the bar instead of church. And what do you know? Things go bad. Things go badly. All of a sudden, there are issues going on. You know, if they could recognize the place of God's blessing and make sure they're there in that place, you just wouldn't get in a lot of trouble. Amen? A lot of us have spent a lot of time in this auditorium. I don't remember a lot of bad stuff happening here. Amen? But you get out there in the wrong place. You get out there in the world. You get away from the place of God's blessing. And you got yourself a problem. Well, idiot, I, I look at this man in this event, this little piece of the puzzle. And I say, boy... I like what I see in Idai. And then we move on to 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 24. And there we read this. And lo, Zadok also, and all the Levites were with him, bearing the ark of the covenant of God. And they set down the ark of God, and Abiathar went up until all the people had done passing out of the city. And so they've got the ark of the God. Here are the Levites and the priests and everything, and they're with David. Okay? They're not with the rebellion. So the ark of God is the presence of God. And they pick up the ark and they say, look, David's going. God's presence is going with him. The ark is coming too. And they pick it up and start moving. Now look what happens here. Verse 25, and the king said unto Zadok, carry back the ark of God into the city. 
If I shall find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he will bring me again and show me both it and his habitation. But if he thus say, I have no delight in thee, behold, here I am, or here am I, let him do to me as seemeth good unto him. Now, David is getting driven out. Here is the ark of God. The right people have the ark of God, and they say, hey, here we go. David looks at it and says, no. There's a place that that ark is to rest. That ark is going to stay there. And if God delights in me, he'll bring me back. And if God doesn't, here I am. Let him do to me what he seem, thinks is good. Now, how's that for an attitude? I've used my illustration. When you get up too far on a ladder, and obviously you look down, and then all of a sudden you get nervous, and man, you grab a hold of that ladder. I've seen times in my life that I wanted something. Maybe you have too. And all of a sudden the old flesh takes over. And God help the person that gets in your way, because you're going to get that. Whether God wants you to or not. You ever been there? Hopefully not. But man, oh man, this old flesh is strong when it wants to be. Amen? It will cheat and connive and lie and steal and everything and do everything in our power. Boom! Sorry about that. My wife told me not to hit the pulpit like that. Um, if we take the mic away, it's not that bad. Uh, you know, we get just, boom, driven. And the next thing you know, we're after it. David, he says, look, no. Send it back where it belongs. Let's put this thing in God's hands. Now, David was a great man. I'm calling that trust. Can we leave our life in God's hands? Can we say, look, I'm going to do the right thing. And I'm going to trust God to put the pieces together. And that's what David did in a very bad day. We've got to keep reminding ourselves the position he was in. He's the king, man. He's led the greatest victories and taken that thing. Now, short of Solomon had the greatest prosperity, but the greatest king considered in all fronts to be King David. And, and the kingdom is promised to him. Jesus is the second coming of David in a sense. I mean, Jesus is Jesus. He's God and David's not. But Jesus is coming back to rule on the throne of David. Man, these are the promises, the Davidic covenant, all of those things that are promised to David. And now he's getting run out of town. But he's holding on to his character. He still has his trust in God. And then uh, chapter 15, verse 31. And one told David, saying, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. And David said, O Lord, I pray thee, turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. Now, I've called this prayer, because that's what it is. Amen? Now, he's got a problem. His counselor, a guy that has the wisdom of God on him, and has been an outstanding counselor. I believe the Bible, I didn't grab that verse, but said, look, it's as if the oracles of God are speaking through him. This guy is, has got it. And he's David's counselor. And they come and say, hey, the old turncoat Ahithophel, he's back with, uh, he's back with Absalom. What does David do? Well, he's going to do a lot of things if you push him. <laughs> but the first thing he does is pray. The first thing he does is pray. Now, prayer changes things. Do we really believe in the effectiveness of prayer? Once again, we'll say, how'd you get saved? Well, I prayed and asked God to save me, and he did. And then we figure we're not going to pray anymore. If anybody really believes in prayer, they're a little out on the outside, they're kooks, they're nuts, or that God isn't really going to change things. God saves us through prayer for all eternity. He gives us heaven because we prayed. Amen? So let's not come in here and say prayer doesn't work. Or I prayed for something one time and nothing happened. Well, God's got his will going on and he's smarter than we are. But the first thing David did, he prayed and he said, God, defeat the counsel of Ahithophel. I love the fact that under the... Now, he's a warrior. <laughs> he's a fighter. And yet, the first thing he's doing is praying. Now, get down to verse 32, if you would. And it came to pass that when David was come to the top of the mount where he worshiped God. We could have put worship in there, amen? Behold, Hushai, the archite, came to meet him with his coat rent and earth upon his head. 
unto whom David said, If thou passest on with me, then thou shalt be a burden unto me. But if thou return to the city and say unto Absalom, I will be thy servant, O king, as I have been thy father's servant hitherto, so will I now be thy servant, then mayest thou for me defeat the counsel of Ahithophel. Well, let's look at verse 37. So Hushai, David's friend, came into the city, and Absalom came into Jerusalem. Now here's a guy, I think a little bit about uh, Brother Sidebacher, who uh, in his time in Vietnam was infiltrating uh, enemy lines. I think about that, but Hushai was going back really as a double agent. He was going back, and he was going to come back and pretend that he was on Absalom's side. And David says, look, you go back there. Look, if you come, you're going to be a burden unto me. We're going to the wilderness, man. We're going to be up and down. We're going to be fighting. You go back there, and you go back to Absalom. And you're going to be a double agent. And let's see if God will use you to defeat the council of Ahithophel. And he did. Are we willing to put our lives on the line for others? Because he's going back there, and if Absalom finds out what's going on, he's a dead man. But he's going back. Friendship. What does friendship mean to us? He said, well, let's talk about brothers and sisters in Christ and all of that. Hey, that's great, as long as we're not passing off the reality of the matter. Because how many times are people just using Christian terms and throwing them around, but when it really comes down, when the, when the rubber hits the road, as they say, really comes down, are they really there? Are they really there for you? Is there something called friendship that says, wait a minute, that's my friend, and I'm sticking with him no matter what? That's what Hushai was. Then I'm going to talk about discernment. In chapter 16, verses 1 through 4, And when David was a little past the top of the hill, behold, Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth. Now, Mephibosheth is one of the kids of Jonathan. And Jonathan was his friend, and you remember that Jonathan, well, he's the son of Saul, and David loves Jonathan, and man, they've got a close bond, and Jonathan gets killed in battle, and uh, David just wants to help out any of the kids of of Jonathan the left around, and Mephibosheth is one of them. He's lame in his feet. His uh, nurse or caretaker dropped him when they were running away from the, uh, the battle with the Philistines, and he was lame in his feet. So, David likes the guy. David's helping him out. So he's got a servant, Ziba. And as David is running, here comes Ziba. And he comes up to David and says the following. Uh, Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth, met him with a couple of asses saddled and upon them 200 loaves of bread and 100 bunches of raisins and 100 of uh, summer fruits and a bottle of wine. And the king said unto Ziba, What meanest thou by these? And Ziba said, The asses be for the king's household to ride on and the bread and summer fruit for the young men to eat and the wine that such be as, uh, as be faint in the wilderness may drink. And the king said, And where is our master's son? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he abideth at Jerusalem, for he said, Today shall the house of Israel restore me the kingdom of my father. Then said the king to Ziba, Behold, thine are all that pertained unto Mephibosheth. And Ziba said, I humbly beseech thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, my lord, O king. Now, Let's go to chapter 19, verse 24. 19, verse 24. Now, David is coming back. Now, I assume I haven't ruined the story for you, because David is going to come back. (laughs) All right? David is going to come back. In verse 24, he comes back. And Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, came down to meet the king, and had neither dressed his feet, nor trimmed his beard, now washed his clothes from the day the king departed until the day he came again in peace. So the minute David left, Mephibosheth knew somebody had done him dirty. He didn't shave, he didn't wash, nothing. David comes back. came to pass when he was come to Jerusalem to meet the king, that the king said unto him, Wherefore wentest thou not thou with me, Mephibosheth? And he answered, My lord, O king, my servant deceived me. For thy servant said, I will saddle me an ass that I may ride thereon and go to the king, because thy servant is lame. And he hath slandered thy servant unto my lord the king. But my lord the king is as an angel of God. Do therefore what is good in thine eyes. For all of my father's house were dead, but dead men before my lord the king. Yet didst thou set thy servant among them that did eat at thine own table. What right therefore have I yet to cry any more unto the king? 
And the king said unto him, Why speakest thou any more of thy, thy matters? I have said, Thou and Zeba divide the land. And Mephibosheth said unto the king, Yea, let him take all, for as much as my lord the king has come again in peace unto his own house. So what's happened here? Is David, well, David took the first guy that came to him and figured he was telling the truth. And then when Mephibosheth came back later, and David could say that he'd been, see that he'd been mourning, he had not been starting to work and get himself all dressed up in regal robes and everything and started to work his way toward the king kingdom. He had been in mourning since David left. When David came back, he could see that. And David must have said to himself, uh-oh, I acted too rashly. And he split things up. I don't know what happened to Ziba, but if David had been in charge of Ziba, he'd have found out a way to kill Ziba. I just happen to know that much about David. Okay? On his deathbed, he was telling Solomon how to handle his enemies. You check it out. Anyway, discernment. Are we ready to avoid rashness? One of the best things... <laughs> Yeah, in the old days, they told us before you spank your kids, count to ten. Now, I don't know if you could count by twos or fives or count real quick or whatever, but, uh, you know, we were supposed to hold our temper, amen? So we didn't kill the little buggers before they had a chance to get to their teen years. All right to kill them then. Um, but are we ready to avoid rashness? Now, Proverbs eighteen seventeen is a good verse. It says this. He that is first in his own cause seemeth just. He that is first in his own cause seemeth just. But his neighbor cometh and searcheth him. You hear the one side of the story, right? Oh, yeah, man, that's some... That's, wait a minute. You better hear the other side of the story, too. You better get it all before you make a quick decision. And I would say on this one, discernment. On Zeba and Mephibosheth. Now... Faithful restraint. In 2 Samuel 16, verse 11. 2 Samuel 16, verse 11. And it's restraint with, a, with an expiration date on it, I would say. But uh, in verse 11, we read the following. And David... Okay, we've got to back up a little bit. To verse 5. And when King David came to Behurim, behold, thence came out a man of the family of the house of Saul. Now the house of Saul might have some uh, problems with David, right? Saul was trying to kill him all the time, and God chose uh, David to take Saul's place. And some of these guys out of the tribe of Benjamin uh, might have had a little hard feelings toward David. That happens. And there came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Jiri. He came forth and cursed still as he came. And he cast stones at David. And at all the servants of King David and all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. And thus said Shimei when he cursed, Come out, come out, thou bloody man and thou man of Belial. The Lord hath returned upon thee all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose stead thou hast reigned. And the Lord hath delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom thy son, and behold, thou art taken in thy mischief, because thou art a bloody man. Then said Abishai. Now Abishai and Joab and Asahel were all brothers, sons of Zeruiah. And these guys were mean motor scooters. Okay? Uh, you don't want to mess with any one of these three. Now, uh, Joab ended up... Uh, not Joab, but Abner ended up killing Asahel in a battle. Uh, he got a little over his head on that. But these guys were mean, mean, mean fighters. So Abishai, the son of Zariah, said unto the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over, I'll pray thee, and take off his head. And he could have. And the king said, What have I to do with you, you sons of Zariah? So let him curse, because the Lord has said unto him, Curse David. Who shall then say, Wherefore hast thou done so? And David said to Abishai and to all his servants, Behold, now listen to this, My son, which came forth of my bowels, seeketh my life. How much more now may this Benjamite do it? Let him alone, and let him curse, for the Lord hath bidden him. It may be that the Lord will look, upon my, look on mine affliction, and that the Lord will requip me good for his cursing this day. And as David and his men went by the way, Shimei went along on the hillside over against him and cursed as he went and threw stones at him and cast dust. Now get a load of that. 
Okay? What I'm talking about here now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call it faithful restraint. Bible says, wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. David is saying, all right, this guy out of Saul's house is all over me, man. Now, he was stupid. Okay, that was stupid. And you'll find out, if you read enough, you'll find out that's true. Because on David's deathbed, he said, Solomon, you're a wise man. You know how to handle these guys. And one of the guys he mentioned was Shimei. And uh, Solomon gave him a few parameters. He violated those, and they killed him. But David said, look, my own son is driving me out. This Benjamite, he's all over me. Leave him alone and let him curse. Fateful restraint. And then I want to say the Lord is a man of war. In 2 Samuel 16, 16. And it came to pass when Hushai the archite, David's friend, was coming to Absalom, that Hushai said unto Absalom, God save the king, God save the king. And he's lying. He's David's friend. He's David's supporter. So he goes into Absalom, he says, God save the king. And Absalom said to Hushai, is this thy kindness to thy friend? Why wentest thou not with thy friend? He said, man, you're, right. you're, you're David's man. What are you doing here? How come you didn't go with him? And Hushai said unto Absalom, Nay, but whom the Lord and his people and all the men of Israel choose, his will I be and with him will I abide. He said, no, God's put you here, Ab Absalom. God's put you here now. Israel has put you here, and I'll tell you, I'm here to serve whoever God puts in this, on this throne. And like the way I serve David, I'm going to serve you. And again, verse 19, whom should I serve? Should I not serve in the presence of his son as I have served in thy father's presence? So will I be in thy presence. Then said Absalom to Ahithophel, give counsel among you what we shall do. Now, look down at verse 23. And the counsel of Ahithophel, which he counseled in those days, was as if a man had inquired at the oracle of God. So was all the counsel of Ahithophel, both with David and with Absalom. So he says, look, what do we do? So Ahithophel says, listen, let's get everybody together. Let's get 12,000 men together. We'll cross over the Jordan. These guys are tired. We'll go get them. We'll punch them down to the ground. We'll wipe them out right now. And man, we'll, we'll, we'll get David. And you kill David. Everybody will be on your side. Come on back. He says, okay, sounds pretty good. Hushai, what do you say? He says, the counsel of Ahithophel is not good. He said, you know those guys out there with David. They're mighty men of valor. They're fighters. He said, and David's not with them. He's hiding somewhere. And you're going to go out there, and these guys are out there like a, a bear, a mother bear, robbed of her whelps. You're going to come out there, and they're going to fight you like crazy. Don't send 12,000 men over there. You give it a couple days. You gather all Israel. And then you go, and you go get them, and you stomp them to the ground. And everybody said, well, the council of Hushai is better than the council of Ahithophel. And they took Hushai's counsel, and it gave David time to get over there and get grouped. And Ahithophel is very discouraged. We'll get to that in a minute. Well, go to 17.7. And Hushai said unto Absalom, the counsel that Ahithophel hath given is not good at this time. Now, on it goes, and I'll tell you what's going to happen. We're going to come back and hear it again uh, real soon. But Ahithophel is going to go home and set his house in order and hang himself. He's shamed. He's embarrassed. And guess what? In one sense, you could say his counsel was good. That might be a little lesson for you. You know, if the, if the multitudes reject your counsel, be careful about going out and committing suicide. There might have been other things afoot. See? But that's what he did. So on this one, you say, what would you put down for this one? I put this down. The Lord is a man of war, Exodus 15, 3. The Lord is a man of war. You're now in a battle. You're now in a battle. And God is playing for keeps. Did you ever remember playing marbles, Dr. Smith, to say, well, we're playing for keeps? You guys remember that? Sometimes you're just playing for fun, you win, but everybody keeps their own marbles. Say, hey, we're playing for keeps. You lose the game, the other guy walks home with your marbles. God plays for keeps. God plays for keeps. There's are going to be bloodshed here. 
And lastly, in 2 Samuel 19, 14, 19, 14, the Bible says there, I cannot believe that I've made a mistake. Let's go to 1814. Let's go over here to verse 9. 2 Samuel 18, 9. And Absalom met the servants of David, and Absalom rode upon a mule, and the mule went under the thick boughs of a great oak, and his head caught hold of the oak, and he was taken up between the heaven and the earth. And the mule that was under him went away. And a captain and a certain man saw it, and and told Joab, and he said, Behold, I saw Absalom hanged in an oak. Joab said unto the man that told him, And behold, thou sawest him, and why didst thou not smite him to the, uh, there to the ground? And I would have given thee ten shekels of silver and a girdle. God was overweight. And the man said unto Joab, Though I should receive a thousand shekels of silver in mine hand, yet would I not put forth my hand against the king's son? For in I hearing the king charge thee, and Abishai and Idai, saying, Beware that thou touch not uh, that thou none touched the young man Absalom. He charged him, he said, go gentle with him for my sake. Otherwise I should have wrought falsehood and against mine own life, for there is no matter hid from the king, that thou thyself would have set thyself against me. Then Joab said, I may not tarry thus with thee. And he took three darts in his hand and thrust them through the heart of Absalom while he was yet alive in the midst of the yoke. And ten young men that bare Joab's armor compassed about the, and smote Absalom and slew him. Okay, they went and killed Absalom. Now you probably remember Romans 8.31. <clears throat> what shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Let's invert that. If God be against you, who can be for you? Absalom went against God Almighty. I don't care how many people he had with him. I don't care how strong the conspiracy was. I don't care how much he had stolen the hearts of the men of Israel. Let me tell you this. If you go against God, you just made a big mistake. And the Bible says this. He was taken up between the heaven and the earth. Well, I'd say that's about the same thing that happened to Ahithophel when he went and hanged himself. Somewhere between heaven and earth. The Bible says that Judas uh, went out and hanged himself. And then the Bible says he went to his own place. You don't want to get hung up between heaven and earth, amen? You want to leave here and go to heaven. And you don't want any choice about it. I mean, you don't want any chance about it. You want to make the choice that's going to work. Now, Deuteronomy says this. Moses was the speaker. He said, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, Choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. And Jeremiah, unto this people thou shalt say, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I set you before you the way of life and the way of death. And Proverbs says, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Now there's one incident in the life of David. Looks like everything's going against him. And everything is, really, except God. And that made all the difference. It looked like everything was going for Absalom. Listen, if God be for us, who can be against us? But let me tell you this, if God's against us, who can be for us? And this whole thing went south for Absalom in a hurry. Just a few days, he was the dead man. David was back in charge. David was back in the kingdom. And uh, the whole situation was righted. But look at all the little pieces of the puzzle that came together there. And the things that we can learn by looking at it, about prayer and trusting God and friendship and the fact that the Lord is a man of war and all of those things that are coming together. Just one little incident. But how many people were involved? How many life decisions had to be made? What am I going to do? Which way am I going to go? Go God's way. Go God's way, because there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. I don't care if everybody in Israel is telling you to, do, hey, let's go this way, let's go do this. Wait a minute. If God's not in it, don't go. You might get caught up between heaven and earth, and there ain't no purgatory. Amen? If you don't go to heaven, you're going to hell.
So you want to, hey, I don't care what the crowd says. Buddy Franklin used to say, your friends can laugh you in a hell, but they'll never laugh you out. I'm sticking with God, amen? And David did. They said he's a man after God's own heart. Did he make some mistakes? Oh, yeah, he made some big ones. He said, doesn't that discourage you? Well, it ought to encourage you because all you and me too are all sinners, just like David was. But God loved him. He made some stupid, stupid mistakes. But let me tell you something. He had a heart for God. And when it came time, man, look at the character he showed. No, take the ark back, boys. I'm going to put this in God's hands. And God took care of the matter, didn't he? Ahithophel's with him. What are you going to do, David? I'm going to pray. God took care of the problem. Father, we thank you. Oh, what a great God we serve. Father, thank you for it. God, we've done some dumb things. But you're a merciful God. And what we need to give back, and you said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And that's the way to the Father. That's the way home. That's the right way. God, we don't want to take Absalom's way. We don't want to take the world's way. We don't want to take the devil's way. We want to be on your team, going your way. And that's life. And like Moses said, choose life. Choose life. Man, we're presented with life and death. All we have to do is choose life. Jesus doesn't want anybody to go to hell. He'd have all men to be saved. He's not willing that any should perish. Choose life. Oh, God, that we would do that on a daily basis. Well, I'm already saved, preacher. I don't have to do that. Oh, wait a minute. We have choices every day. Choose life. Grant it, we pray, and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.